we've heard several rumors that uh, there's something strange about mixing up the stock exchange with Zen. <laughs> they don't think it can be done. But a good Zen man can do it. <laughs> In the first place, Zen is a form of Buddhism which more or less simplified the entire teaching with almost no emphasis upon philosophy and a tremendous emphasis upon action or we might say a cultivated inaction. The whole principle of Zen is based upon the four hindrances described by Buddha and the hindrances are the four lessons that every human being must learn in order to grow. And as one of these hindrances is the stock exchange, <laughs> in principle. But the Zen man calls it wealth. Wealth is to a large degree today a matter of business, of investment, of speculation, of accumulation, of the formation of vast institutions and organizations for the advancement of economic interests. All these come under the heading of wealth, and wealth is the first hindrance that is studied by Zen. Now, the purpose of Zen is very simple in base. It is the individual clarifying the facts of life on all of the levels with which he is associated. We all have different life patterns, but we all live in the same basic life situation. And our adjustment to that situation is the secret of health or sickness, life or death, wealth or poverty. Now the adjustment of the individual to his world is not what he's trying to do in most cases. What he is trying to do is make his world adjust to him. He expects to be master of every situation, and in due time he is mastered by every situation. He cannot achieve his primary goal, which is to be the ruler of the world. The only thing he can ever rule well and efficiently is himself. Now in the... Uh, hindrances as set forth by a Buddha, there are four principal causes of trouble. These causes of trouble are not new. They have been with us since the dawn of time. We have known about them. We have read about them. We have passed through the conflicts and disasters which they have caused. But in the end, we deny them. We pay absolutely no attention to them. The more great structure of success is built first upon wealth. And wealth is a very antisocial uh, pattern to begin with. It becomes critical when we realize the futility of it. Uh, one of the points, uh, one of the hindrances is described in Zen by a simple little verse that is a key to a great many truths. And the verse is a little poem, a koan. And the little verse reads, The shadows of the bamboo brush the temple steps, but the dust is not raised. Now, that's a very subtle thought. In other words, it is only a shadow. And the shadow has no power, but it looks as though it does. It looks as though the shadow should raise the dust, but it's nothing but a shadow to start with, therefore it cannot. And most of the life that we live today is a shadow, a shadow cast by something and to which we give vitality and life and reality, but it has none. So we'll start a little bit now with the problem of a Zen man trying to work on the stock market. He's going to have troubles to begin with. For in the first reason, he was going to consider the stock market as one of the principal hindrances. If it is a principal hindrance and stands in the way of growth, 
Why bother with it? Why not make a law of some kind and abolish it? You don't abolish these things because the stock market is nothing but the long, selfish shadow of man himself. It is the way man wanted it to be, but it never could be. And as a result, from the beginning of time, most of the miseries of mankind have been based in wealth. To have it, to lose it, for someone else to have it. These are all disasters. And actually, what is wealth? It is a shadow. In the first place, it has no permanence. We live in a world in which we do not live forever. Therefore, nothing that we accumulate can stay with us more than a few years. So we give the first half of life trying to control a situation which we will lose in the second half of life no matter how we try to live with it. We can accumulate all the wealth we want to, but as this little ball spins on around the sun, none of these things that we do have any permanent significance. It may be nice to have them for a while, but it is also hard to go through the process of loss. And the wealthy man does not die with any better conscience than the poor man. But we have this great secret of wealth. We have the problem of investing. We have the problem of multiplying industry. And from a button tree under the, on the south end of Manhattan, we developed a great institution that now follows the time signals around the world, and 90% of humanity is hopelessly enslaved to some aspect of this system. The only ones that are free of it are the unfortunate aborigines who are luckier than they know. But here we have a world that is locked within a problem of buying and selling, a problem of shifting about, a, a problem of uh, uh, all forms of bookkeeping, all forms of taxes, and all kinds of stock investments and investors and agencies for handling these things. And when it is all done, we have something like we had a few months ago, a minor shift in the financial situation that shook the world to its foundations. And to have as the foundation of security something that can evaporate that quickly indicates that we're not very wise in setting our institutions in order. We are not using the proper wisdom. Now, in the Zen man was in this position, the first thing he would do was to say, you are not a bo you're not born a broker or an investor. You're not even born a Zen man. You are born a person, gullible to many things, insecure for the greater part of life, and living in a mild state of fear most of the time. So if you're going to be a Zen man or a stockbroker, there are certain disciplines you have to have. And the stockbroker doesn't have them, not the trace of them. A few agents may have a little of it because they are playing only with other people's funds. But for the most part, those who are handling the money situation believe in money. They believe firmly that money is important. And they believe that if it drops in New York, it will fall in Tokyo and will gradually go around until it drops another degree in New York. It is one constant circle in which the lifeblood of a cultural system is invested in wealth. This is the thing that makes the world go round. We have more automobiles now than we have space for, but we have money enough coming in to start a new factory or two and start another enterprise which will be stock shared by various people. We have more of nearly everything that we do not need. But the one thing that we need most of all, common sense, is in short supply. In fact, it's been back ordered for a long time. <laughs> so here we have a man who wants to become a happy, well-adjusted, well-balanced investor or merchant. The first thing he has to do is really to become a Zen man. He has to get over the first of the great hindrances, 
and that is his belief in the sanctity of his own processes. He has to face the fact with perfect certainty of clarity. He cannot afford to make any speculation that he cannot afford. He cannot do anything that hazards his peace of mind. If he knows, if he has more than he knows what to do with, that's different. But even then, we notice that the ones with the most suffer the most from a small loss. So it can't be based on that. But your stock expert must be a completely self-integrated person. He must be an individual balanced in pain and pleasure. He must be capable of taking loss as pleasantly as he takes gain. He must realize from the beginning that he is playing on a checkerboard and that nothing that he buys or sells has any value except what he puts on it. We are under an economic system and everybody values these factors, but every so often we get a nasty uh, bump when we try to progress these matters further. We are today in the collapse of a great financial system. We are in it because nobody had any background in Zen. All right, what is the necessary background in Zen? Zen was established within Buddhism by an East Indian prince from the state of Cochin who went to China when it became obvious he had too many older brothers to ever bout to anything politically in his own country. He became a monk and has been known over the world as Bodhidharma, in Japan as Daruma. He is represented usually as a round, like an egg-shaped figure, wrapped up in a red robe all the way up and nothing showing but his face, which has large eyes and a grimace. Uh, this is old Daruma. In the toy department, you will find him in this little paper mache egg that he is made in. Uh, usually has weights in the bottom so that you can't tip it over. And that was one of the principles of Zen, that you can't tip it over. No matter what happens, it comes back the way it ought to be. So there, this uh, monk became the founder of a system of self-discipline that was to greatly affect most of the world. It has come down to us in many different forms, shapes, and, say, and sizes, but the original principle is the immutable, uh, immutability of internal poise and control. As the first of the hindrances, the hindrance of wealth must be analyzed. The individual who invests must realize exactly what he is doing. He must realize that no matter how much he makes, he is not making anything. The same of his losses. He is shifting about an intangible sense of value that is violated every day and offers infinite opportunity for corruption. He is caught in a financial pattern based upon the single thought that wealth is important. Wealth is freedom. Wealth is a liberation from all forms of pressure, when in reality, wealth is the cause of most of the pressures that we suffer from. Having decided to become a Zen man in this matter, the investor must look upon his investment as a kind of symbol, something that he should learn from. And the big lesson he is supposed to learn from the whole thing is, don't do it. But it takes years and many, many, many collapses of empire to realize that the world civilization cannot be built upon wealth. We have regarded as wealth, of wealth as the most desirable, the one permanent worthwhile thing, but it is not. There has never been a civilization that has survived the abuse of it. There's never any indication that a world is better from the creation of wealth. It is more complicated, and we can see that today. We have all these nations struggling against each other, revolutions inside, outside conflicts, political ups and downs everywhere, armed forces using up vast amounts of public funds, and no peace in sight, 
And the whole pro problem is based upon the first hindrance, which is wealth, and the second hindrance, which is power or fame. The individual who can be a leader of something, who can be made dog catcher of the community, has a new estimation of himself. There is an aura of grandeur that builds up around the public servant, no matter how inept he may be as a person or how unnecessary he may be as an official. He is on his way to glory. I've known two or three rabid socialists who got appointed to some small office and became almost immediately very dominant uh, believers in the monetary system. <laughs> All it took was a, a, a little job and you became part of a great thing. And this in it, that itself brought with it a note of greatness. So the uh, wealth-power combination are the first two hindrances. They both hinder the power of the individual to think straight. They make us all accept the misfortunes of the past as inevitable, and that to project them into the future is also inevitable. With all the talk that we hear around all the time, there is no actual getting at the root of it. There is no real cure. There are only two processes, and one is to delay the inevitable, and the other is to modify it to some small degree and shift the weight onto something else. But there is no solution. You cannot solve a problem that has no solution except the abolishment of itself. Now, you cannot abolish it because you would have 50 revolutions in no time. So the Zen man simply says there's only one way of getting rid of it, and that is outgrow it yourself. There is no other way. There's a story in China of a great Mandarin who, being very wealthy and in favor at court, bought a beautiful villa and a lovely garden and settled down to enjoy the, the glories and beauties of life. Not long afterwards, a wealthy industrialist who was not of the favored class, also came into money through business and decided to buy the next property, the property right adjacent to that of the Mandarin. When he got the property, maybe it was, we won't know for sure, but maybe it was the uh, lion bar, uh, 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 paste or salve. Oh, tiger bomb, tiger bomb. Maybe it was the tiger bomb man that did it. But anyway, he got this villa next door, and he proceeded to lay it out so badly and so uh, extravagantly that the Chinese cultured man next door was going into fits. He couldn't stand it. Every time he looked out of the window, he was antagonized. He was disappointed. He tried to buy the other property, but the man who had it said he'd put so much money into his beautiful garden, he wouldn't sell it. So there was no peace there. And he would, the, the aristocrat would just sit, look out the window and wish something could be done about it. Finally, a Zen man, who was his friend, came to him and said, What's the matter? Oh, he says, This man's garden next door is driving me crazy. What can I do about it? Oh, the man said, It's a very simple thing to do. You don't have to buy it out. You don't have to do anything. Well, he says, what do you mean? So the Zen man got up, looked out the window, talked, turned to the rich man, and pulled the shutter across. And he says, you're cured. You don't have to see it anymore. And that is somewhat the way Zen handles this type of thing. It handles it in a way in which no great surface is moved, but the individual's relationship with the things around him is markedly changed. Next, the point is that a hindrance is always a lesson. A hindrance is always an examination. It is a way of testing the integrities and values of things. And the four great hindrances of Buddhism are tests of your own character to prove whether you are strong enough to graduate from the grammar school, which we call modern life. If we, could, can, if we want to escape it, we have to outgrow it. There's no way of, of 
eluding the responsibility of personal growth. Therefore, if wealth is a problem, as it is in the world today, and there's no nation free of it, and there's no nation enjoying it. It used to be that the rich family lived on the hillside with a beautiful home, and everyone was just jealous of them. Today, the rich family is just as badly off as the poor family. There's something wrong. Maybe the money has spoiled the whole family. But whatever it is, nothing is right. And it is all wrong because of emphasis. Because we are not using these different instruments to advance our integrities, we're using them to cater to our desires. And there's a great deal of difference between those two points of view. So the Zen man would point out that wealth is probably the basic problem today in the world. Almost everything, to a degree at least, is dependent upon the monetary system. The monetary system is used not only to forward purposes, but to buy various forms of delinquency. The monetary system is abused to distraction at the present time, and it's going to probably be a little worse. It is going to be worse until we realize that it was not a blessed discovery, but what the Zen man calls a hindrance. It was one of the things that stands between the individual and himself. It is something that he is allowed to take over from the outside, the values of his life. He lives under the pressures these outside things have created, and he has no time, no energy, no life left to release his own potential. He is forced to live constantly, over-influenced by his environment. Now, of course, one of the problems in this field is education. We hear all about education. We watch the books and textbooks that are issued. Listen to the various accounts of what should be done with education. But we do not find any clear statement for young people as we would find it in the case of the Zen man. The Zen man would say that education is the individual growing up into his own maturity. And he must be helped by whatever means helps him to be himself and does not merely make him a profitable unit in something that has no existence to start with. In other words, the education of today is, fit, is to fit us into the economic theory rather than to help us to raise it, improve it, or escape from it. And it's the same thing with all investment problems. The investment is more or less the heart of the entire economic system. It all depends for the circulation throughout the arterial structure of economy that the financial situation be kept above water. It must be maintained. But it's reaching a point where it cannot be. And it never was really solvent. There's never been a time when there's really been solvent in the sense of security. It's always been that your securities were insecure. And this is a very important point. So in the Zen man, if you're going to really understand it, must understand in perspective just how small this world is and how little greatness there is in it. This little world with its floating around in space is accredited as being so important that we have killed each other by the tens of thousands and the tens of millions simply to own pieces of it. And it keeps right on going, indifferent of us. It never knew we existed. It doesn't care. The whole struggle is a, a, a fight in a sandbox. The individual fighting with a shadow, or another individual, over something that neither one of them can ever possess. All of this financial problem, therefore, is a hindrance. It's a hindrance to growth. Now, a Zen man might say, what is growth? What, do, what can we do to make this situation one of permanent value to ourselves? The answer is, we must to grow means to out, outgrow or overgrow a condition that exists. Growth is a progress. It is not measured in wealth, it is not measured in national incomes or products 
or in uh, sales and investments, growth is an, is an unleashing of a greater measure of enlightenment. Growth is to become wiser, better, and happier. And the civilization that we now have will not confer these virtues upon us very easily. A happy person today who is not simply mentally deranged is very far hard to find. And even the happiness we have is very perishable and can be dispersed or uh, destroyed by some passing event. So the Zen man starts by saying, what do we need? What is the thing that we're trying to do? We have come into this world with a gift of some nature. We have a mind capable of thinking. We have a heart capable of loving. We have a body capable of serving. We have all kinds of opportunities. And we have an ingenuity with which to invent and devise things. Now, if all these abilities are used properly, we are a very constructive unit in society. We are something that can help others and can help ourselves. But our primary purpose is to unfold through ourselves the universal truths that are the foundation of existence. We are here to manifest reality. We are here to accomplish in daily action the wonders that we read about in books. We are simply not here to be better than our neighbor. We are here every day to be a little better than ourselves. There is no place in growth for competition. The moment competition comes in, ulterior motive is there, and Zen dies. Uh, there was, uh, years ago, there were a series of articles in the New Yorker on Zen. And one of them had to do with Zen in athletics, Zen in tennis. Zen in golf, Zen in archery. And a lady who was the wife of one of the writers did an article, Zen and Flower Arrangement. Zen was therefore the effortless effort by means of which the simple reality in ourselves will come out if we don't block it. The individual who tries to be good seldom succeeds. The individual who becomes within himself a better person is good without frustrating any of his natural inclinations because his inclinations have been purified. Therefore, in the problem of Zen with all these things, the first thing is to discipline the self in value. What is important? What is valuable? What is the greater good to the greater number? What is it that does not finally turn like a venomous reptile and destroy the creature that fashioned it? We do not all want to form some monster of Frankenstein. We do not want to create a civilization that is a continuous blight upon humanity and the earth. So we have to understand things and accept them as facts. The narcotic addict uh, takes a few uh, shots of something or other and feels for the moment that he is ten feet tall and forgets altogether entirely that it won't be long before he will be six feet under. He you know, doesn't think of that. He'll take a larger nose the next day because of that moment when he feels so big. Zen says you can have the biggest moment of your life and it be honest and true and real and doesn't need any drugs to fortify it. The moment the inside begins to take domination over the outside, a better part of ourselves becomes obvious. We have within our own nature the power to accomplish any reform that is necessary upon ourselves. We can gain any skill that we wish to of ourselves. We can have just the kind of an environment we want if we create it ourselves and preserve it. So that everything that is good is available, but it is blocked by the hindrances. It is blocked by the individual who cannot be happy unless he is a billionaire. It is blocked by the idea that he must be wealthy, that he must have summer homes, and that he must dissipate in various ways 
danger in so all of this is based upon the fact that to have is to be happy the Zen man would then suggest that you try to find this happy wealthy man and you will find that he is burdened with all the problems that life can possibly bestow upon him there's a story in the Muslim world about the great emperor who was told by his soothsayer that he was dangerously ill and the only thing that could cure him would be if he could wear for one day the shirt of a happy man so they sent the couriers all over the world to find the happy man so they could bring the shirt to the emperor and finally one of the emperor's servants came back to him and said sire I don't know what we're going to do we have found your happy man but he doesn't have a shirt <laughs> that is good then it is based upon the simple concept that the integrities of life are the only things that survive the human being is part of something bigger only when he consciously becomes part of something bigger he's a little being on this earth with a stock exchange but this has little or nothing to do with his citizenship in the universe the Zen man is looking to be a citizen of the universe a good citizen in right standing he must be correct he must have the enlightenment so he goes to discipline now the Dharma who was the founder of it all in this particular case has left some very interesting examples and recommendations as to what will help the individual to gain this detachment and the first thing that Dharma pointed out is that you cannot be deluded miserable and mistaken unless you are ignorant and any form of knowledge which does not help you to overcome the hindrances in yourself is not knowledge it is some kind of a mistake that is masquerading under credentials but it is not honest no form of learning that does not help you to overcome your own faults as they are in society is really educating you it is giving you a siwash polish it is making possible for you to go out and cheat somebody else but this has nothing to do with becoming a better person education has not emphasized that the true human being is one who can live with himself without breaking the laws of nature or without destroying the happiness of others this type of knowledge we don't have we can go perhaps and put another shuttle on the moon or something and become very excited about it and the same day this happens if somebody drops a bomb somewhere we have no realization of the interrelationship between knowledge as we gain it here and wisdom is it's a natural and eternal foundation we cannot say that any person is educated who has enemies or makes them we cannot say that anyone is educated who can't hold a home together we cannot say anyone is educated who doesn't keep the reasonable laws of human courtesy the drunk driver on the freeway may be a graduate of a great university but he is completely uneducated education is to become aware of the realities and when we apply this to the stock exchange we have to say we have to become aware of the motivations of the values principles and technical processes by which this is institution is maintained and if we do this we will begin to discern day by day more and more of the illusion that has been taken to mean success we will become more and more aware that in that problem we are not only in great danger of phys a physical financial loss but even greater danger of moral and spiritual loss the individual who has his mind all his life on stocks and bonds is not getting very far in the release of the divine potential within himself the, the nature that set us up in the first place would have given us a, a built-in computer or something if we were supposed to have it but we're not 
were supposed to grow and release through experience, dedication, insight, and thoughtfulness the values of the natural world we live in. We are here to understand the planet, not destroy it. We are here to use its, to its various values, not abuse them. We are not here to make the planet into a dead body by draining out it every bit of life that is in it. We were given a beautiful planet to live on, and we were given the keys and the knowledge of how to take care of it. Therefore, it's up to us to do it. And that's what we're not doing at the present time. We are allowing these atomic wastes and things to accumulate with the full knowledge that someday those accumulations are going to break through. <coughs> Our only hope seems to be they won't break through on us, but they're going to face, be faced by our children and their children. We are simply not recognizing that there is an overall philosophy of life that must be obeyed. We are not using the knowledge that is naturally available to us. And the, uh, one of the great reasons why we condone wealth and condone these things is because we believe in the concept of power. We believe that the powerful person is a success. We can't prove that he lasts any longer than anybody else, but we feel that it is a great success to be a page and a half in the encyclopedia. That means you've really done it. But when it comes to putting you away, you're just exactly like everyone else. The path of glory leads but to the grave. And why then have, make such a problem out of glory? Every one of the things that is getting us into trouble gets us there because we believe in it, because we have been deluded into accepting it, that we have mistaken one value for something that was not valuable. All these things are part of the, what we must face in the years that lie ahead. We must face the problem of distinction. Now, at the present moment, we have a great example <coughs> of fame going sour on us. We have an example now of what happens to a reputation that runs for politics. Everything that we do, everything that we try to earn, turns upon us, and every ordinary mistake we make is magnified and our virtues are forgotten in this comparative structure that we call civilization. We are not in the world to be famous and no one's life is that famous if we get close if we get close enough to it it is only famous until a snoopy reporter finds out <laughs> then it isn't famous anymore but why do we work therefore so hard to push her away into some public position with a full realization that a good zen man wouldn't be found dead there it is simply the fact that we have a completely wrong standard of values. And this standard of values is killing us. It is it's allowing, allowing us to neglect and forget the great basic principles of truth upon which the human race was based. So the second hindrance is the definite effort to get ahead, to get to a higher position, to have a little more wealth to show a little more of our abilities. And pretty soon we are going to be in a position where we can't even buy the necessities of life. We go through one cycle of financial inflation after another, and for what? This little ball floating in space has no more surface than we see. It has no more under the surface than is there, and we're depleting it as rapidly as possible. When we completely deplete the interior and completely demolish the exterior, where are we? We are not going to graduate to a better planet because we will have failed the examination here. To get this thing straight, we've got to return the planet to nature in as good a condition as we found it. And we should be way finding ways to improve the stability of the planet and not the financial cupidity of the inhabitants. We are just approaching the whole thing in a completely wrong way. Now, if the Zen man was involved in something like this, he would point out another factor that comes into our thinking, which doesn't necessarily represent general public thinking. 
if we are, uh, as Socrates said, if we are to live beyond the grave, if some part of us goes on, then we may have to face the answers to a great many questions. He did not believe in damnation, but he believed that the individual might have to discover how ignorant he had been, which would be a great shock to him, especially his ego. Or, on the other hand, is he going down to a silence and will never be heard of or seen or thought of again? Is he a mortal creature with nothing beyond the grave? With either perspective, I think Socrates is more or less correct. If you do not have any life beyond this one, live this one as well and fully as you can. If there is a life beyond this one, if there is something afterwards, then prepare for that by revealing the very best of your nature and turning this world into a school where you learn something every day. We are here to learn, not luxuriate. And we've lost sight of those valuable points. Then we also have the, another point, another hindrance, and that hindrance is a problem that we call vice. Hindrance is uh, largely a matter of providing the funds to allow the individual to dissipate in any manner possible without being able to be properly punished. He will buy, he will buy <coughs> his exemption from the natural consequences of his own conduct. This is available to us in every newspaper today. It is present in our attitude towards entertainment, towards literature, towards art, towards music. Everything shows a complete disregard for the very plan that produced us. Here we are, very complicated creatures. The human body is one of the greatest mysteries of all time. Whatever it was that created it, fashioned it, or put it together, was a genius beyond anything we can even conceive. Here we are in the presence of an absolute miracle. And then we turn around and feed it with heroin and cocaine. We have not thought about the values of anything. We want to have that feeling of superiority. We want to spend more. We want to have more vices and, um, and more moral delinquencies than anybody else. This is great. But what does it amount to? Nothing. Now it seems to me that one of the problems we're facing now in the shift into another century is that we cannot go on as we have. <clears throat> we cannot keep on with this process of constantly breaking every rule in a desperate effort to be happy. We cannot go on destroying our earth right out from under us. We cannot continue to abide by simple selfishness. We've got to find ways of doing things right doing things with discipline and order. Now one way, of course, is ordinary education. Our ordinary education, if the textbooks were honestly written and the courses were honestly taught and the running the institutions were sufficiently enlightened to know the difference between reality and error, we would be much further ahead. But we cannot expect this or demand it at the moment, although it is definitely coming. At the moment, we can depend only on what we can do. And it may well be that the average person who wants to have a better life may have to start educating himself after the schools have given him all they can. He may have to build his own Zen life, which is something in which he begins to impose a discipline upon his own spoiled nature. If you neglect a child up to its 10th or 12th years, you're going to have a lot of trouble with it. If you neglect the adult human being after middle life who has had no training in doing things right, you're going to have a difficult time, and so is that person. Yet it is necessary for each individual who wishes to get out of any problem he's in, and nearly everyone is in several, is to begin the cultivation, the cultivation of an internal life that is appropriate to the needs. So Zen says, do it by various small, small, short steps at first. 
Do things that you think can be done with proper with propriety. Keep appointments correctly. Get over pushing anything into the future that needs solution now. Stop trying to be happy all the time with pleasures that mean nothing. Try to escape, for instance, the hypnosis of the television. Uh, try to not become completely addicted to the dynamic divinity of the computer. Let us gradually recognize that the products of our ingenuity are interesting, but it is the being that created these products and can create still better ones that is something to be considered and given attention. We've got to begin to be truthful. We've got to le learn to get over extravagance. We don't need everything that we want. We have to begin to curb our transportation. We're going to have cars about blocking every road in the world. We have to get over our dissipations. We have to get over the tremendous money we are wasting and begin to put a discipline upon our life. Pythagoras set up a discipline system that was quite proper. He began with a retrospection. Every night before a person goes to bed or goes to sleep, they should think over the day that has just passed. What did they do that was good? What did they fail to do that should have been done? And what did they do that was against the best of all concerned? How did we use that day? Did we use it? Did we abuse it? Did we waste it? And if we can't say that we used it, we better try a little harder tomorrow. Every individual should check upon his own conduct. There's no use putting a psychiatrist on it. It's not necessary. It, it, they can't do anything for the most part if the individual himself does not want to. And the individual who really wants to is a person who desires to, bet, to have a better life, to get over all the frictions and losses and sorrows and struggles that have been his burden since the beginning of his existence here. It's a matter of getting hold of these things and doing something about them. Then in the evening, then in the morning, when he gets up, or while he's still in bed, give ten minutes, five minutes, whatever time is available, to a plan for a good action that day. That some um, bill that's been cold, we'll pay it. Some friend we should have called up on the phone, we'll call them. Uh, some neighbor who asked a favor, we will try and grant it. Now, we, if we have visitors coming in, we will be prepared for them. If we don't want them, we should not invite them. And if we do invite them and they come, we should be nice to them. We should try to make things as they are, factual, simple, direct. And with all these things, no regrets, no wishing they hadn't come. No wondering why they didn't do something better. Not blaming someone because they didn't send us a Christmas card. Getting rid of all this type of thing and live in a quiet, calm acceptance of the inevitability of the now. That we are here to in a quiet and steadfast way unfold the locked potential within ourselves. We can control our reading. We can control our activities. We can also control the need for a talent or an ability. If we are going to recreate, we must recreate constructively, never as a waste of time. If we want to gain knowledge, we should study it. If we want to gain pleasure, we should learn the arts or something by means of which we discipline ourselves. We must also recover from the observation complex. The individual who thinks they are improving by merely watching somebody else work. The individual who goes to the museum and appreciates the art but would never think of studying anything themselves. Each individual should try to release the potential within themselves under the discipline of proper self-control. They should be doing the thing that they need to do in order to grow in order to fulfill the proper destiny. 
If they do not grow, they are going to die as ignorant as when they were born. And no individual who passes out of this life without discovering something of distinct value, any individual who can pass out of this life without saying at least under his own breath, I have learned something and I am a better person. If this happens, something is very wrong with all of civilization because that is why we are here. Now another point that's important to realize is that good, the good life, the Pythagorean discipline, does not result in a cold, hard existence. We are not supposed to lose a sense of humor. We're not supposed to become grouchy. We're not supposed to become so superior that we can't get along with other people. The most in, in, in unimportant person in the world is the one who thinks he's more important than anyone else. We should be always learning to grow graciously, to unfold and develop the, abili the abilities that we have with kindness, with charity, and with good humor. The person with no sense of humor is in a bad way. Even the Greek philosophers were very definitely inclined to humor. They believed that humor was important. Humor to laugh with people but not at them. He wanted to carry along interesting stories that in a gentle way sometimes have very great meaning. So we have to do all that we can while we're here to simplify, directionalize our efforts. We must not take it for granted that we are simply here to wait for the inevitable end. We have many people come who tell me that they wish they were dead. Those people haven't lived. They haven't discovered the value of life at all. A few infirmities, a few disabilities, or some bereavements, they've taken away from them their own sense of judgment. Everyone has a right to wish to be living as long as he can live and learn. And when he reaches a point where he can no longer learn, then and then only does life become meaningless. And sometimes that happens when he's born. And we never do, he never does catch up with the tremendous privilege of being alive. So the Zen man looks out of the window and he sees a beautiful garden out there. The same garden uh, that the great Mandarin had. He sees a world of wonders and a world of great and glorious opportunities uh, to help but he will not see any desire to cut up a piece of it and call it his own. There is nothing in this world that is more foolish than ownership. Nobody owns anything. We don't really own our own bodies. We don't own anything and the Emancipation Proclamation didn't liberate us from ignorance, which is the only enslavement that is real. We therefore have no really, no priority upon tremendous gains in land. We don't need to cheat farmers out of their soil. We do not need to do destroy our competitors. These things are all part of the great ignorance. When all there is left that we really need to consider is to be productive, useful, and creative people doing the good deed that comes to our hand and doing it with all the heart and joy that we have. The Zen man will never have a broken heart because he does not live that way. He does not think that way. You can't really have a broken heart if you don't dislike anyone or dislike anything. And if you dislike yourself, you have to get over that also. There are no broken hearts where there is wisdom because where there is wisdom, there is love. And where there is love, there is never a broken heart. There may be hurts and pains but through them all comes the deep realization of an infinite reality and a kinship with all that lives that cannot be destroyed by any event that may occur in a personal life. So we say now, here's a, here's a man who's going to be a talk broker. We're going to start him out very simply. We're going to start him out in the morning with his childhood prayer. But he's a small child. He's going to make pray in the morning two or three minutes with his mother or parent or whoever is with him. He's going to learn to begin in the beginning the reality of God. He's going to learn that there is a divine power that shapes our ends. 
he's going to realize that he's going to come into a world of divine principles which he is able to help or hurt according to his own attitudes. As he gets a little older and goes to school, it's going to be very important that in his life some elder, not in the school faculty, is going to help to maintain his integrity in the usage of knowledge. He is also going to learn at that point how to help in the maintenance of the establishment uh, that he belongs to. He's going to help in the garden. He's going to help in the cleaning of the house. He is not going to permit all this work to be done either by the rest of the family or by hired help alone. He is going to be part of a family which means to work with the family, to do things, and not to run away and have a big time with the boys down on the vacant lot. The uh, problem is going to learn to begin to realize his dependence upon life. He's going to learn to respect his elders. He's going to learn how they lived, how they made their way. If they are very wealthy, he should probably develop pity for them. If they were very poor, pity. If they were in the middle bracket, they were the most fortunate and they should be uh, congratulated. But he should start in with a social life with a life of belonging to humanity. It may very well be good for him to join some youth organization, like the Boy Scouts or something, to get a little bit of the idea of, of wor working together on problems. When he goes to school, if he's going to be a stockbroker, he might very well to take a, a course in uh, law as a lawyer, or perhaps as a psychiatrist. Don't take a course in business because that will make an atheist out of you quicker than anything you can do. <laughs> but take some course, maybe fine letters. Maybe come, like we have a potential stockbroker who begins as a watercolor painter. Whatever it is, something that gives uh, existence and reality to some gentle light within himself. Something that makes him feel good by doing something nice and uh, doing something that's not for profit. And if he takes any kind of work to start with, he should be, give himself fully to it. He should be taught by his family or by experience that if he is employed and paid for employment, he is expected to go do the good day's work. He is not provided with any uh, inducements to do something wrong, however, or he leaves the job. All along the way, and if he decides later to marry and raise a family, all the way along he is human. He knows poverty. He has seen the sick. He understands loss. He realizes the temptation of wealth. He realizes the temptation of power and realizes that if he expects any special reward, he must earn that reward by his own personal conduct not by his friends or some political pull somewhere. He must earn whatever good he hopes. And as he gradually gets uh, to middle life with this kind of a point of view, is a good family life, has good friends, he will probably be not likely to go to become a stockbroker. He probably won't want to be because he will see too much there that is not real. But if he does become a stockbroker, he will understand fully the problems of loss and profit. He will understand that if he is investing the funds he has saved for a lifetime on the stock deal, he is foolish. If he is putting in more than he can afford to lose, he is foolish. If he is tempting someone else to do the same thing, he is dishonest. If he wishes to do it himself, he must then be prepared as a Zen man to accept loss. If it happens that his fortune is entirely lost, he must be able to have the same peace of mind and the same quietude of spirit and the same recognition of the divine purpose in things as he had when he was at the top of the financial pile. If the loss of uh, what he has detracts from what he is, there's been a double tragedy. The Zen man, however, will not be caught in that. He will not be caught by anything of that nature. If he should, which is unlikely, ever invest in anything of that nature, he will lose the perfect contemplation 
of what am I learning? What am I gaining in terms of eternal realities? Is this another lesson to prove me that I shouldn't fool with these things which are of no value? So what should the Zen man then do instead of investing in such speculation? Well, the best thing that he can do is to inv is invest in the perfection or development of his own nature. We are all full of opportune factors. We are all of us full of potentials. There is something in every human being that never gets a chance to come out because the outside is so active and oppressive and is so distant that there is never a chance for the inside to come out. Instead of using our years simply to try and make it easier here where it will never be easier anyway, it is quite better to try to develop the power to become a citizen of the universe, to a citizen of, of tomorrow, a citizen of a world that is bigger than ourselves. Uh, Dharuma, the original teacher of Zen, was a believer in reincarnation. He believed in it as most Buddhists do. And he also realized that the tomorrow is simply a, a checkup. It is a balancing of the books. And that what we do and what we learn and what we contribute to the common good, these are the great wealths. To the Zen man, wealth is, the, is good karma. It is good karma resulting from good action, honestly, simply, and, and gently uh, used to help other people. Good karma is sometimes simply the fact that we do a good deed without even knowing it because of our instinct to be kind. All these things that we build in character are the great wealth. What we possess physically we leave to our heirs to fight over. But anything that is worthwhile for us to worry about has to go with us when we go. We have therefore built a dichotomy here that is unreasonable. We have assumed that we can live badly here, go to sleep and forget it forever. Nature wouldn't work this way. Nature doesn't waste things like that. We're, nature does not spend millions of years building human beings and then to wipe out the consciousness within them. The body that we have, surely we'll lose it. The distress is too great. And the physical environment doesn't permit an eternal physical existence. But there is no doubt in the world uh, that something does survive. And what survives is rich or poor or according to what we do right here now. And wherever, as is mostly the case, our, after, our appetites and ambitions physically have in them elements of dishonesty. They are not strictly ethical. They are as ethical, we can say, as those of our neighbors, which means nothing. But they are not ethical in the terms of natural law. Therefore, wherever they are, they do not help us in the big picture. They may give us a few days of of so-called success followed by a tremendous interval of regrets. Now, if you want to really speculate and buy all kinds of odds and ends, the first thing you have to do is get the right attitude toward it. An attitude is that no matter what you buy, how you speculate, or how often you invest, you are never going to have anything. You can simply take what you have to the edge of the grave, and that is the end of it. And that edge with many people is not so far off that it's worth the compromise of integrities that people make in order to get it. They will, the individual will destroy himself for a few years of prosperity. It's a very poor deal. And even in the years of prosperity, his problems linger. No one who is prosperous is without responsibilities. So the Zen man says you can have anything you can have that doesn't hurt you. You can do the, anything with yourself that do, you know inside of yourself you will not regret. If you are sure that what you are doing is right for you, you do it. 
and you'd pay no attention whatsoever uh, to the hindrances. If you were wrong, you will be told in due time by nature that you are wrong. But if you meant well and did the best you could, that's all that's expected of anyone. So if you want to put a few hundred thousand in the stock market and you don't mind losing it, and you'll be just as happy if you do lose it, you may then be one of the few who win, because life is just like that. In the article on uh, Zen and archery, this man was a good archer, quite a champion and bow, with bow and arrow. And there is a building, uh, Sanju Sangendo in Japan, where the site of which is an archery range. This is about 600 feet, good long range. And the Japanese archers uh, were very good. They had a small target, but they hit it very regularly. But this American had very trouble, very deep trouble, trying to hit the center of the target. He stood and he stretched the bow and he looked down the shaft, the arrow, and he wiggled and twisted and pulled and tightened and closed his eyes and opened them again and blinked and tried to find the target and always missed. So the Zen man came along and talked to him a little while. He said, don't do it that way. You'll never hit it if you do it that way. If what you want to do is just simply take the bow as though you were a child and you didn't care where you hit. Throw the bow in the direction you know it should go let nature in that nature's instinct guide you and just let go of the arrow. You did it and hit a bullseye. He then found out that tension was the thing that was destroying his archery. Tension is the thing that destroys the stockbroker. Tension is the thing that brings the stock market down. Tension is the thing that breaks homes, destroys health does all kinds of foolish and silly things to people. Zen says don't have it. Whatever you do, do it with all your spirit and with all your complete self-discipline. If you're going to fall off of something, fall off and relax completely. And sort of say to yourself, here goes nothing. And you probably won't be hurt. Brace with everything you've got and you'll break your neck. Tension, therefore, is one of the things in business and in home life and in everything that you do. The tense broker is going to have a nervous breakdown after every drop in the stock market. The uh, tense family will have a broken home when everything goes wrong. Everywhere tension, stress, and the building up of defenses against truth are dangerous occupations. We can build no defense against truth. It has to have its own way. And the only way we can cooperate with it is when it sets in, say, here, come and take it. In other words, truth must have its way. And it's fighting truth that's killing people every day. It is fighting truth that is destroying nations. It is fighting truth that destroys the integrities of life. And it is this same thing that creates ordinary human beings and transforms them into guerrillas and anarchists. It is this tremendous flow of essential ignorance. And this ignorance is due to the simple fact that the individual has never even tried to understand himself. He's never given a day's thought or a day's understanding to the wonderful being that he is inside himself. He may have concealed that wonderfulness pretty thoroughly, but at the same time it's there. There's something about the human being that is divine even at his worst moments. But there's something there that is tremendous, infinite, something in, indescribable. The physician can never sound its depths. The religionist can never understand its functions. The philosopher can never fully comprehend its meaning. But all these things meet together to one tremendous thing, that the human being, as the Zen man says, is a creature capable of molding itself into the perfection that it needs and, de and nature demands of it. The Zen man knows that he was born to grow. He wasn't born to have. If he has, he'll endure it. He wasn't born to have not. 
if he has not, he will endure that. If he wasn't born to lead other men, well, then he will be born lead as a follower and will follow. But whatever it is, he will never for a moment lose the nature of the divine purpose within himself. He will learn that all things in which he is inadequate are tests of himself. They are the hindrances that he must overcome. And until he overcomes them, he cannot expect anything but the discomforts that are his daily uh, companions along the way of life. So if you want to be a stockbroker, always say, I am well conditioned, I will never be sorry if I lose. If you want to be a very wealthy man, uh, say, I will never be sorry what I lose. And uh, if I take it to the grave, I will only hope that my descendants will not abuse what I abuse to get it. All the way along we have these problems to face. But Zen is a philosophy of facing them gently, simply, kindly, softly, but immovably. Zen never for a moment compromising its principles. The stock market uh, Zen man, while the business was honorably done, would probably serve it as well as he could. But the moment the time comes when corruption creeps in, a Zen man will step out. He will not for a moment allow himself to be soiled by association with that which he cannot believe to be true. If we would all step out of what we don't believe, we'd some find some big changes in this world. You'd find we'd have much better people in better positions if we demanded of them an integrity and we're not worrying so much about their political allegiances. What we need is to support that which is true. And if that which is available is not true, we will build our own inner life on our own. We will correct our own mistakes. We will properly use our own resources. And we will never fail in family or friendship or health or sickness or work or companionship to live according to a principle of integrity. And the principle of integrity is very simple in itself, that we are here in this quest of truth. We are here seeking to know the reality. And if we are going to learn the reality, if we are going to have the courage to search for the real, then we must have the courage also to live with it if we find it. We must be prepared to live the right kind of life before we can uh, look for it courageously. But then comes the interesting thing. Well, we are thinking of all the things we have to do without in order to be good. When we think of all the bad habits we have to correct in order to be happy, it looks tremendous. But the Zen man makes the most interesting discovery of all. That when he lives straight, he hasn't any of these problems. He hasn't one single thing to worry about. He hasn't lost a thing. The only thing he has really been de deprived of is his troubles. He is, finds that the, the true life of the Zen man is happier than any other person can possibly be. Because he cannot lose. There is no sense of loss. No sense of gain. Only sense of service. Only sense of being true to the great universal structure to which he belongs. He moves himself from a citizen in Lower Manhattan to a citizen of the universe. He becomes part of the great motion of life toward the fulfillment of, himself, of itself. This is the true journey. And no one who takes that journey weeps over it or is sorrow about it or is tired as a result of it. We are always sick and tired and worried and defeated because we are wrong in our conduct. If we are right in our conduct, this fades away, and we discover an immutable good, a tremendous value, a great and marvelous extension of consciousness, so that we can meet the problems of the day without problem or without sorrow. We will be all right as long as we keep the rules. And in this life, we are building towards something better. 
we are toiling, toiling towards a bigger universe than we have ever known. And it is necessary, particularly now, with our present realization of world affairs, to recognize the obvious, to accept the real with a full understanding of what it means. We can no longer deny these things. We can no longer hide them. We can no longer conceal a war behind some foreign front. It is everywhere. We cannot see poverty because of some one nation in trouble. Every nation. We cannot have the religious upheavals. They're everywhere. Never before has the whole world been involved in its own karma as it is today. Never before has it become so apparent to everyone, everywhere, that the path of glory leads but to the grave. We are learning little by little, and in the next few years we will learn more rapidly. But today and right now, as we start along the way of tomorrow, it is possible for the thoughtful person to see the facts, to become aware of the things that are going wrong, and make sure that there is nothing in his own life that is doing the same thing, that he is not making in a small way the same mistakes that in a big way are endangering civilization. The time of selfishness and self-interest and exploitation are done. They have dominated science, religion, philosophy, and industry for ages. But we have gradually come to the point where our little planet, which is our home, which is the place we have earned the right to be in at the moment, can no longer survive our mistakes. We are going to have to start to think of the planet itself as the great sick person, and that that sickness has been caused by the creatures that live on it, and that the time has come when the healing of the world demands that the people on the world get over their grudges, economize their resources, and work together in friendship and in amity. It is the only way we can solve the problems of the moment. Well, I guess that's it. And uh, I'd like to say, on uh, Monday evening at 7.30, my wife is speaking in the lecture hall upstairs, and the subject will be the, the interpretation, the truth of the mouth, the coming age that we are all facing. We know that many of you will be interested. Thank you very much.